Good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'd like to say that uh, it's an honor to be here to share this round table with Okide and Imadu. They were both my professor at the university and Ian Martin. Uh, I also like to thank Professor Diana Bryden for this uh, project. And um, the, my, my concern for this uh, talk about language policy, I'm going to divide my talks in three phases. The first part, I'm just going to say what is my main concern with language policy, my interest in language policy, and some theoretic background about this aspect. The second part, I'm just going to give you an overview of the Brazilian language policy, uh, mainly from the last 12 years. And then I'm going to illustrate with my own research with uh, uh, a group of teachers in a public school in Brazil. Um, so, language policy and education. So, um, this is my first interest in, in language policy. And I'm quoting uh, Ofelia Garcia and Johami talking about language policy. Uh, because language policy is something that tradi has traditionally been considered as imposed, as a top-down way of uh, dealing with, with policy. And, uh, and I think, particularly in Brazil, there are not many studies about the implication of language policy and teacher education. And this is my, my initially concern in research in language policy. So language policy in education has imposed by political entitlements in a top-down manner, usually with a very limited resistance. Uh, and most generally schools and teachers uh, comply. Educators, I like this, uh, and I, I, I put in, in red, educators are soldiers as a system. So they are bureaucrats that follow orders unquestionably. And I don't know if this is really true, but this is the way that, you know, normally government treat um, teachers. And I also like this other uh, quote here from Opelia Garcia, when she says that language policy, uh, despite of the existence of official documents, language policy, education policies, are socially constructed and dynamically negotiated on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. And I think this is true because despite of having a document, you know, when the teachers close the doors, things happen different. And also, it is our role as a researcher to negotiate with them, I think, when they have a new uh, document. So this is my uh, main concern, my main interest on, on, on language policy, uh, that Menke and Garcia uh, mentioned that this is a new way for uh, education language policy, you know, to study language, language policy in schools. I also like another context from um, she also used uh, teachers as policy makers, uh, another um, way of looking to language policy. So this question is not mine, it's from uh, the authors. So how language policy education, uh, how are language education policies interpreted, negotiated, resisted, and recreated in the classroom? So I think there, there is a huge implication of this document for uh, research and the focus is more based on agency and implementation. Uh, so the school is seen as sites for implementation as well as contestation of language policy. In other words, so sites for reinterpretation, negotiation, recreation of language policies in the school. This is my interest in research in language policy. Um, again, Richento, another uh, contribution of language policy to research. Uh, research on language policy can contribute to understand how differences are experienced in different contexts, as well as to understand the mechanism that contribute to keep the status quo. And I think this is interesting for our project, because now how differences are in, in different states, for example, or in how differences are perceived in different countries re in relation to language policy and the implication for uh, teacher education. Uh, Lobianco states that language policy tends to be seen, uh, language policy tends to see education as a field in which policy about language is applied and implemented. In other words, not just uh, focus on, on documents, on analysis of documents. So researchers focus attention on education, teachers, teaching and interaction in the classroom rather than simply dissemination and implementation of decision making by policymakers. So this is a new way of 
I wouldn't say new way, but an, uh, a focus nowadays to look to, to language policy. You know, this implication in the classroom and not just on the documents. And now how can we collaborate with the other ones? There were some other uh, research uh, from the 90s. They were focused on, on innovation. And these uh, focus were more based on the success and the failure of the implementation. And there is not much, I think, to learn from these studies because from the failure we just learn from what not to do in the classroom. And the success, I think, is very questionable. So uh, this focus nowadays is more related to how, what they do in the classroom and how can we collaborate with them. And this is related to globalization study from Fazal Rizvi and Bob Lingard. Uh, and this is very true in our context, specifically in Brazil. We have many documents being launched every two years, every four years. Uh, so they say that in the period of the last 20 years or so, education policy has become almost synonymous with educational change and linked to what might be called fast policy making. Educational professions have become more skeptical of reform agendas <coughs> and less committed. And most of these policies are just answer for external forces such as globalization, such as the International Monetary Fund, or for the, the test, the PISA test and some others. You know, they have to show indicators that they improved their education. They have to say that uh, we are having new documents, we are investing in education. But again, we, we don't know, we, we know that this is not true in, in fact, and this is my uh, uh, concern here. This, I, I just illustrate here this as how this fast policy making is happening in Brazil. I'm just dividing two contexts here, the federal level and the state level. This is, I just started from 1998, that is the one famous document in Brazil, the Paramos Curriculares Nacionais, and there is, in 2006, there is a new document for the federal level. Bokir and Limay wrote this, they are co-authors of these, these documents, and many other documents were written. So all these documents, most of them are from the same segment. So we have one federal document for all the Brazilian schools, and then another uh, state, state document for, for the Brazilians as well. And then the students, you know, the teachers have two documents. So they don't know, you know, should I follow the national or the, the state document? And this was my uh, research, you know, uh, interpreting these two documents specifically for their, their context. Fazal Rizvi and Bob Lingard also uh, call these uh, many documents being put forward as symbolic policies. These symbolic policies refer to those policies that there's no investment attached. So just, you know, to show that it's not, I think, our case, but, you know, in general, that just show that they are doing something new. But there are new policies apart from this. This is just, I'm talking just about documents, but there are other policies, for example, for course books. And now we have another policy for teacher education that I think Bokir is going to talk later. And what happens, because of there are so many documents and because of this false, fast, false, fast policy making process, teachers are tired about this process. Sometimes they receive, they have one document now, and then after three years, another document. So they say, oh, we are tired of these documents, you know? Um, this, this is from the first phase of my research when one of the teachers said, as I told Berval, when I read this kind of document, I didn't want to continue because I think it won't help. It only criticized our local context. She's referring to the, uh, to the local document, you know. Um, and this, this is about the first phase of my, my research, and I think this is my interest was to negotiate this document and to negotiate the goals of language policy for the other schools. And I'm just going to focus on this first phase because I don't have time you know, to cover all the research. I'm just going to, to focus on the first phase that the importance of negotiating with them, uh, the role of the English in the school because of there are so many documents. Um, so uh, in, the first, in the, fir the, the first part is the conflict of the objectives. So she says, I have this competence, so what is, to, you know, what is the importance of teaching English in, in public schools? I have this document, I have this competence, she said, she comes from, uh, this teacher was also a teacher in a language course. I have this competence, she was referring to linguistic competence. And I have to deliver it to my students, and they have to show the result. And that has caused me frustration, because she wanted to do the same with the, the, 
you know, in the private sector and the public sector. So again, uh, as Chris says, seen as the, the as just transmission of the knowledge to the next generation, focus on knowledge and skill, and my intention was to focus on more critical aspect. And again, in the other example, she mentioned about the importance of teaching the language as related to culture, but then she doesn't. I have to problematize what kind of coach with them. So just quote in press here. So which culture or cultures are to be point of reference for a global curriculum? Whose power, whose authority, in what domain, how exercised? So these are the things we discuss in the first phase of this, this project. And, then, and this is, I think, that is important in the, this process of collaboration. I'm just focused about, there are so many different kind of objectives that they don't know what to follow. And this was the first, uh, my first um, objective with them, you know, to establish some objective for uh, teacher education based on the national curriculum that uh, Okia and Demario had written. And this is the, the importance of uh, one important aspect, I think, in, in collaboration with, with these <coughs> teachers. Uh, and I'm also interested in the, uh, using local knowledge, but you can also use contextual knowledge if you like. So local knowledge referring to the their teachers, you know, their knowledge and how this knowledge can be negotiated and how they can change over time with our collaboration. But the, the, the idea is not to empower them, not to emancipate them. So there are things that we have to revise during the, the teacher um, education. So in relation, I've just quoted Steve here. So these are important aspects I think I'm learning. Privilege, learning from below. A new logic of emancipation, not something horizontal way of thinking emancipation, but more, uh, not a, a vertical way of thinking about emancipation, but a more horizontal way. Uh, the pedagogy of interruption, so we don't have, uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, so it's a kind of uh, a weak pedagogy, so it's nothing related to the, to the success, more related to uh, subjectification, uniqueness, and the, um, related to action as Hannah Arendt has, I'm just quoting this part of Hannah Arendt, and the importance of treating the, the teachers different. I'm just going to go back to this year's unlearning privilege. I'm just going to read one very short uh, quotation from Spivak. So what do I mean by unlearning privilege and learn from below? So new views of research require collaborative work as well as more interdisciplinary dialogues to deal with the complexity of the problems. Studies can benefit from the specific concept of unlearning privilege and learning from below. They refer to an ethic that has to emerge and to discipline our privilege and having critical consciousness. This privilege has also to do with losing privilege of having certain knowledge about the other. The traditional research in English language teaching development and the way discipline has been treated isolated from educational aspect has not fostered other possibilities of abandoning such privileges. And the pedagogy of interruption. It is something that cannot be, uh, it is something that can be guaranteed, cannot be guaranteed as an outcome or particular education institution or pedagogy. So again, it's not a strong pedagogy. It has more related relation to uh, subjectification. And just to finish this part here, uh, related to action, related to uh, teacher's agency. So I'm not there just to change their context, but it just create a way of collaboration that they can develop their own um, agency. So action and freedom, I think, is also important in the aspect of collaboration. <coughs> so to be isolated is to be deprived of the capacity to act. As soon as we raise the otherness of the other by attempting on how they can respond to our initiatives, we deprive the others of their actions and their freedoms and as a result, we deprive ourselves of our possibilities to act and hence freedom. Again, just, you know, have to respect the other. Just to conclude this, I'm just going to show a very one minute video about this collaboration with the schools. I have some other uh, narratives, but this is, this is one of the, the principle of the school. And she's just saying about the importance of the collaboration between the university and the schools. She's saying that we have to go to schools, you know, have to, you know, uh, and how things have changed in their context, but not because I had, you know, I had the answer for their problems, let's say, but 
uh, the importance of this collaborative work. Um, short you know just to show you know the this work with them so I'm I conclude this project I actually I'm starting another project next year but this is something I'm going to talk in Winnipeg right <laughs> so just wanted to give the overview of how I see language policy and the importance of have this contribution between the university and public schools and how can we learn from each other that's it thank you